It's hard. I don't think it's wrong to wonder why sexual minorities are placed in a situation that can sometimes appear predestined for failure. These questions are completely valid, but they do come from a more short-sighted perspective. Growing up a gay Latter-day Saint who wanted to live in accordance with the commandments, I experienced a lot of dark nights. It's completely understandable to want to take the more worldly, short-sighted approach of removing the standard. To submit to God's will, that is when true miracles occur. We should respect personal agency, but also Ultimately, a few years ago, my wife Amanda and I were at this family event and we got talking about the dreaded LGBTQ topic with a distant relative. It's one of those topics that seems to exasperate and alienate everyone from all different directions. And this is especially true in the context of faith and from what I've observed within Latter-day Saint circles. This conversation was relatively short. It wasn't deep or philosophical. He was just sort of vaguely familiar with the podcast that we've done where we talk about my experience with same-sex attraction, our mixed orientation marriage, and I genuinely appreciated his desire to relate, but the conversation did take a turn. In trying to sympathize with our situation, he said something to the effect of, isn't it just so awful that there isn't a place in the church for LGBTQ people? The statement took me by surprise and neither Amanda nor I really knew how to respond. I couldn't disagree more with what he was asserting, but even though I'm rather active in this conversation, I do still get frequently tongue-tied in personal interactions, especially regarding this topic. So we ended up saying something like, oh yeah, it's, it's a hard situation, which is true, but hardly provided any sort of helpful dialogue. So the conversation fizzled out, and Amanda and I were left to later Monday morning quarterback the situation. I'm sure many of you have heard a similar claim or recognized this sort of what I would call a defeatist attitude among church members when it comes to people who identify as LGBTQ. As far as I can tell, it's relatively common and while usually based on a sincere desire to sympathize with the plight Latter-day Saint sexual minorities face, it's far from being helpful. In fact, it's hard to overstate just how enabling and damaging this approach can actually be. It's usually based on the assumption that for sexual minorities, the best or the only path to life satisfaction is pursuing a same-sex relationship. And then with that assumption as a starting point, there are usually three common rationalizations that flow out of that. Number one, the prophets are wrong. Number two, God is wrong. And number three, the system is wrong. So first, the prophets are wrong. This appears to be the most common rationale. Church members take the true statement, prophets are fallible, to an extreme. They turn the fact that prophets make mistakes into a belief that prophets are actually standing in the way of God's true will for us. They'll often conflate past policies like the priesthood ban and polygamy with repeated doctrines like those found in the family proclamation, modern revelation, and ancient scripture. And then from there, it's easy to elevate personal revelation, real or perceived, above the counsel of modern prophets. If prophets are fallible enough to stand in the way of God's true will for us, couldn't that include fundamental things like the nature of eternal relationships? Couldn't that mean that God could actually inspire someone to pursue a same-sex relationship if that is what makes them happy? You can see where this chain of reasoning can go, and the attitude is unfortunately pretty common in the church, at least from what I have observed. One powerful antidote to this flawed thinking is truly understanding the proper framework for personal revelation. Uh, conveniently, an apostle of the Lord gave a talk on this very thing, aptly titled, A Framework for Personal Revelation. Elder Runland outlined how and when God speaks to us and what he will and will not say. Personal revelation will be in harmony with the commandments of God and the covenants we've made with him. Consider a prayer that goes something like this. Heavenly Father, church services are boring. May I worship thee on the Sabbath in the mountains or on the beach. May I be excused from going to church and partaking of the sacrament, but still have the promised blessings of keeping the Sabbath day holy. In response to such a prayer, we can anticipate God's response. My child, I've already revealed my will regarding the Sabbath day. When we ask for revelation about something God has already given clear direction, we open ourselves up to misinterpreting our feelings 
and hearing what we want to hear. Applying this to the experience of same-sex attraction, it can be easy, and I'll add increasingly common, for Latter-day Saints to adopt a morally apathetic attitude towards same-sex relationships. After all, who are we to judge whether or not someone has received personal revelation that a same-sex relationship actually is the best path for them? Now, I don't pretend to know the ins and outs of the relationship each of my peers have with God, but I don't think we need to know those intimate details in order to understand, through modern revelation, how God operates. As Elder Runlin said, when we want something, especially when it's something that we really want, it is extremely easy to confuse that desire with a divine stamp of approval. Also, when we remove the burden of the commandments from our lives, we'll inevitably feel some amount of relief. And it's easy to confuse that relief with the feeling of comfort and peace associated with the Spirit of God confirming our choices. We're taught that the Spirit works through feelings and impressions. And deciding a commandment that feels limiting actually doesn't apply to us can feel pretty good. It's easy to confuse that relief with something more divine. So the second rationale is that God is wrong. And from what I can tell, this seems to be the least common rationale. In my experience, most of the time, the blame is placed at the feet of the prophets standing in the way of God's true will for us. But occasionally, I do see this line of thinking, and I'm sure many of you have as well. In essence, the idea here is that prophets are declaring God's will, but actually, we sometimes know better than God. I call this the God will beat us with a few stripes rationale. It goes something like, it would probably be better for me to keep the commandments, but it wouldn't be that bad if I ignore them or some of them. I can sort of skirt around them, maybe lose out on a few blessings, but ultimately I will find the true joy I am looking for. We use this rationalization in all areas of life. I see this in myself with other more menial things, something like, I want to pick out on junk food because I'm feeling stressed and I may feel bad later, but right now I'll feel better. Boiled down, it's settling for satisfaction in the present instead of enjoying the lasting joy Christ has promised if we'll follow him. Usually church members who embrace this rationale fully admit that the choice they're making isn't technically in line with the doctrine, but they're okay living in that ambiguity for now, hoping something will be revealed later on to make it all make sense. The last rationale is that the system is wrong. Now this one I think has the most truth embedded within it. And when I say system in this context, I'm referring to something like the structure of the eternal cosmos distilled down into an accessible theology we call the restored gospel. And then of course there are more temporal systems we use to try and understand that broader system, such as church, governments, culture, etc. Within this broad system and these smaller systems, there are plenty of disparities, which is why I say that this rationale has the most truth embedded in it. It's also the rationale that more effectively pulls at our heartstrings. Disparities are hard, and in a temporal, more short-sighted sort of way, they very well may be unfair. It's hard and may even seem cruel to ask church members who experience same-sex attraction to either marry someone of the opposite sex or forego an intimate relationship altogether. Admittedly, there is something inherently Christ-like about the impulse to try to rectify disparities like this. I don't think it's wrong or evil to wonder why sexual minorities are placed in a situation that can sometimes appear predestined for failure. All of these questions and concerns are completely valid, but ultimately they do come from a more temporal, short-sighted perspective. One of the hardest aspects of life is that it's full of disparities. Some can be rectified and they should be, but some are just part of human diversity. Requiring that a sexual minority either remain single or pursue marriage to the opposite sex could be considered a disparity when compared to heterosexual couples. In a more worldly, short-sighted way, it is unfair. It's completely understandable to want to take the more worldly, short-sighted approach of removing the standard. Living in accordance with God's will is no question difficult and sometimes painful. We can't forget that Christ himself, the greatest man to ever live, asked if there was any other way to achieve the work God sent him out to do. And while our pains and afflictions and complexities 
definitely pale in comparison to his, they sure don't feel insignificant when we're in the midst of them. Like all of you, I've experienced plenty of trials that have felt insurmountable. Growing up as a gay Latter-day Saint who wanted to live in accordance with the commandments, but also who felt this unmistakable pull to pursue other guys, I experienced a lot of dark nights and often felt completely alone. When we lost our son in 2019, the hole he left in our lives was unbearable. What I have learned is the trick is to follow the entire pattern Christ outlined in the Garden of Gethsemane and his life at large. We can't just stop short of asking if there's any other way. We have to instead choose, as hard as it is, to submit to God's will and declare some variation of not my will, but thine be done. That is when true miracles occur. Uh, that is when weak things become strong and our greatest trials become our most joyous blessings. So how can we navigate through all of this? Well, why does God give us commandments? Is, is it because he wants to control us? Is it because he loves the power? I don't think so. I, I believe in a loving father in heaven who wants the best for us. Because he operates from a higher plane, I think it makes sense that he would have standards we may not fully understand right now. Any good parent has standards for their child that the child won't understand. But because the parent has more experience, they operate from a higher perspective. And they implement those standards despite the child's protest for the child's safety and their success. So while we may not have a full understanding for why God allows circum certain circumstances, such as sexual minorities experiencing same-sex attraction, we can choose to live his standards, experience the fruits of doing so, and then recognize those fruits as evidence of God's love. It's well documented that married monogamous couples report the highest levels of life satisfaction, that children from those two parent, mother, father families fare the best in all areas of life. And I think one of the reasons the eternal family is structured as it is, is to get as many of God's children in that ideal situation as possible. Now, of course, not everyone will or can do so. And that obviously includes many of those who experience same-sex attraction. We should be courteous to those who choose differently. We should respect personal agency. But part of the role as members of, of Christ Church is to firmly, lovingly, and resolutely advocate for keeping the eternal nuclear family as the ideal. And as one who believes in modern day prophets, who have the capacity to speak the will of God and who have been consistent and repetitive in their counsel regarding God's plan for eternal families, I personally don't see any other morally consistent path than to sustain them and treat their words with confidence. If you are an active Latter-day Saint, I urge you to do the same. So I've been doing a podcast for the past four years and I've really enjoyed doing it and getting feedback, mostly positive, occasionally negative. Uh, what I'd like to do now with this channel is to morph what I have been doing into more of this format. With each episode that I put out, I want to uncover something about the state of LGBTQ issues, the conversation within the church, and then offer ideas on how Latter-day Saints can respond to it in a way that recognizes the plight of this group while still upholding gospel truths. I also plan on bringing on people with personal experience or insight into this topic within a faith context to have an honest conversation. So if you resonated with any of this or know someone who might, please consider sharing this video with them. And if you wanna support this series, consider subscribing to this channel. I hope to see you in the next one.